Welcome to Xamarin University and ENT 410, Data Caching and Synchronization. In this course, we'll learn how to construct data caching and synchronizing applications. We'll talk about why we care about caching and synchronizing our data, and then we'll explore the fundamentals of creating an application with those features in mind. We'll start by caching the results of our network calls to provide some offline capabilities. Then we'll move on to a more advanced case of editing offline data and syncing it back to the server. We'll finish by quickly talking about some third-party solutions that you might choose to use instead of writing your own synchronization code. Let's begin by looking at the various types of network connected applications that we'll be using. First, we'll see how we can make our network connected applications more robust and more resilient. And then we'll explore the options you have when you're creating network enabled apps. Now, if you're coming to mobile development from a background in desktop or web development, something that might be new to you is the fact that we can't really rely on a network. In web or desktop apps, we typically don't have to worry about our network connection, at least not nearly as much as we do on mobile devices. And let's face it, our phones and our tablets will lose connectivity. Always. It's not a matter of if, but when. When we're developing our applications, we need to assume that the network will fail. It will fail before we make our server call, and it will fail during the server call. We need to code defensively, and we need to be ready to handle these failures. All of our network access calls should, at a minimum, be wrapped in a form of exception management. Typically, this is a try-catch block so that you can manage bad connection or other network events. The last thing you want is a missing network to crash your entire application. You know, de designing an application that works when you always have a strong, persistent connection is relatively easy. And that might have been okay back in 2008 when the first... Uh, App Store apps were released for the iPhone. But the bar for quality has risen significantly since then. Today, users expect and even demand that at the bare minimum, their apps don't crash when the network disconnects. So instead of crashing, we could simply disable parts of the UI and let the user know that this app requires a network connection. And we cover how to listen for those network change events in our XAM 150 RESTful Web Services class. More often, though, our users have even come to expect that the app will have some type of offline support. And this could mean that we locally store the last known copy of the remote data, or we could even add a local queuing system, and we could allow the user to continue to edit their local data and deliver it to the server when the network reconnects. So before we attempt any remote network call in our applications, we first need to check to see if we have a working network connection. This doesn't change the fact that the network operations might still fail. Even if the network is connected and the host is reachable when you start your call, you might still lose connection in the middle of it. So again, make sure to be super defensive around the code that you're writing. Before attempting any remote network call in your application, you first need to check to see if you have a working network connection. Each platform has its own native APIs to do this connectivity testing, and we cover these again in our XAM 150 class. And then here we can see an alternative approach using a library that we can use to check connectivity cross-platform. When you have networked applications, they will generally fall into one of three categories. First, there's online only. So this is where some of the functionality is only available when you're online. Online banking apps, Skype, uh, chat applications would all fall into that category. Next is online with an offline cache. So these would be apps that store a read-only copy of their data locally so that we, we can still use them when they're offline. So for example, RSS readers, news readers, uh, Twitter, news apps, Kindle, Facebook, those all have offline cache. And then lastly, we have online with offline editing. So these are apps that have full functionality when they're offline and they allow you to create, update, and delete entries and then synchronize those changes with the server. As an example, Office 365 will allow you to create documents offline, edit them offline, and then synchronize them back up to the server. Of course, the complexity involved in writing these types of apps increases as we move from the left to the right on the slide. So we'll start just by looking at online-only apps. These apps need to be resilient to network failure because their functionality depends on a persistent network, 
and it's really easy to write code that will throw an exception and crash the entire app if the network suddenly disappears. And of course, you should avoid this because this is a horrible experience for your users. They will uh, mark you down on the App Store reviews and possibly stop using your app. So again, we need to be sure that we're checking if the network is available before making a call and then handle any exceptions that occur during the call. In addition, you should use visual cues on the screen when the application is offline to let the user know about the status and that some functionality is going to be limited. You could also maybe prompt them to check their network and try to reestablish the network. Maybe they're using a cell network and the cell went down, but there's Wi-Fi available. So now we've talked about the basics of network connectivity, and we've seen how to make apps more resilient and talked about some of the options for networked applications. If you haven't taken XAM 150 yet, I highly suggest that you do, as we cover this information in much more depth there. Now we're going to move on to the next type of networked application, one that has an offline cache. In this objective, we'll take a look at what's required to store results offline for later access. So first of all, we're going to recommend, uh, we're going to look at a recommended architecture for storing your data locally for later offline access. And you'll also have an exercise to work on an application that's online only, and then update it to perform some local data caching. Now data caching in the context of mobile apps allows you to take the data that you retrieve from a remote service and then store it locally on the device so that when you're not connected to the network, you can still access the information in a read only manner. Normally, this means working with data in a local SQLite database. However, simply saving files to the local file system is also perfectly acceptable. You might have news or images coming down as XML or JPEG files, and you could easily just persist that data into files. You could even save the JSON result from a REST call into a file, load that file up, deserialize those items into objects in memory, and then use link to query it. Use whatever mechanism works best for you and your app. Also, remember, not every bit of data should be cached. Just like with anything in software, there are benefits and drawbacks to caching the data. This is going to be different for each app, and you'll know your app's needs better than anyone. Now let's think about a common workflow for a data cached application. You'll make the request to the remote data source using something like HTTP client. The service will then return the data response to your app. This will probably be in JSON or XML format, although it really could be any MIME type. You'll then store this data locally on the device. And you'll want to make sure to cache the data every time you receive uh, successful updated data from the server. Again, this could be in a SQLite database or as a file in the file system. Now, Because we'll code the app to always load from the local cache, we're now able to continue working while we're offline. From the UI standpoint, as long as there's data in the local store, the UI can continue to work. In the example for this project, we have the data stored in a local SQLite database so that when we're offline, we can load our data from the local database instead. Now, you might also have data that expires. So there's data that's only relevant for a specified amount of time. Weather forecasts are a great example. You can cache the forecast for offline use, but we probably don't want to use the data that's several hours or several days or several weeks old. Now, how, how often you do this is dependent on your data and your user's need. But remember that every time that your local mobile application reads data from its local cache instead of calling the server, you are reducing the server load on your back end. Now, you might have learned the techniques involved to access a network resource in one of our Xamarin University Web Services class, like XAM 150 and you would have learned how to store data locally in SQLite from our XAM 160 data class. Well, implementing data caching is realistically an effective combination of these two methods. First, you're going to download the content from the network resource, and you'll have a, a client class that will access the network. So in this example, that would be the job data service class. Second, you'll use your SQLite repository client class to store the results in the database. When you're trying to load the data while you're offline, you'll determine that you don't have a network connection. You'll load them directly from the SQLite client class instead. And also don't forget to inform the users that you're offline and that they're looking at stale read-only data. 
And when you're caching data in an app, the data might not only refer to information that's going to be stored in a local database, but it also might refer to assets useful to display the details of, things like image files that are represented by URIs. Well, the URI image source class in Xamarin Forms will cache an image for one day. The caching time, however, can be for longer periods of time using the cache validity uh, property. So here you can see a sample of demonstrating a simple string value that contains a URI and returning a UI image source, source that caches the image on the device for 30 days. You could use this code in an image source binding to change the default URI image cache. When you test your app, make sure to test it in real world scenarios. Turn on airplane mode, disconnect from the network, disconnect in the middle of a server call, try driving around or walking around with the app, go through tunnels, go over mountains, go in cement basements where the cell signal is weak. Test in all kinds of conditions to make sure that your app provides the best experience to your users. Apple and Google and Microsoft are going to review this when they review your app, and they're going to test how your app behaves in these scenarios. Make sure that your app will pass those tests. When you're testing network applications, you might want to go through a number of testing situations and try to emulate the system under test. So in particular, you should be sure that you're testing the following situations. Test when you have an unreliable network. When you have no network at all, like in airplane mode. When you switch between networks. And of course, when you have a reliable network. These are just some of the core situations that you will need to test to reliably have trust and comfort that the application will run. And ideally, when you're testing your applications, you should be using a physical device, just like your users will be. Simulators and emulators usually piggyback on top of your laptop or your desktop computer's network connection, and they might not truly reflect the network test. For example, the iOS simulator, it is fast, and it appears in many ways to be the same as a physical device, but actually it will not respect when you put the simulator into airplane mode it will still use the active network behind the scenes. So in order to truly test the network on the simulator, you should download the Xcode additional tools. You can download those tools directly by opening Xcode and selecting Xcode, open developer tools, and the more developer tools menu, which will take you to the Apple developer portal, and then select the additional tools for Xcode for your current version of Xcode. After installing these tools, you'll have the network link conditioner. You'll be able to go into the settings app and configure your system so that the network will emulate particular conditions like being on a 3G network, a 4G network, an LTE network, or even a network that drops 100% of the packets. Moving to iOS devices, if you have enabled developer mode on the device, you'll be able to run the network link conditioner directly on the device. You might need to ensure that your devices have been provisioned for development first, and then to run it on the device, you'll navigate to developer settings on the device, and there you're going to see a pre-configured list of network types you can run. These will be identical to the one that you saw in the Mac client. Now the Android emulators are the closest emulator to the native platform. So turning on airplane mode here, or turning off the Wi-Fi on, on the emulator, will cause the emulator to perform just like as if it didn't have a network. When you're running on the Windows simulator, you can toggle the network state by selecting the double arrow to display the advanced tools and then enable network simulation. So now you're going to work on the first exercise. Open up the worksheet that you downloaded from the Xamarin University site for this lab and open exercise one and you will enable caching in a pre-existing application. Pause this video and then come back when you're done with that lab. So now we've talked about how we can implement a read-only offline cache in our applications. In this next section, we're going to talk about actually synchronizing our data back to a remote server. So we have two issues that we want to look at today. We want to demonstrate the patterns that you would likely use for adding offline editing capability to your application. And then we'll also look at talking about the challenges that you're going to face as part of the synchronization process. Now, a lot of people ask about best practices for data synchronization. 
Well, it's our belief that there are no best practices. There's really only doing the right thing for the context of your app. And we use this tweet as an example because it defines the kinds of challenges and variances of implementations that you'll experience with data synchronization. What we're going to show here in this class is simply one potential architecture to solve this problem. You might come up with a different architecture as long as you keep in mind some of the things that we're talking about. And there are many reasons why we might want to edit our local data while we're offline. Maybe we want to collect data while we're out on the road. Maybe we have factory workers checking on equipment with an iPad and they don't have a network connection. We'd want to be able to update the data while we're disconnected and then synchronize those results back to the server once we're back at the office. Maybe we want to analyze data offline. We could generate reports while we're on an airplane, for example. Or maybe we want to log some location-based information. If you have a hiking or jogging application, you might want to log those even if you don't have a, a network connection. Data synchronization in the context of mobile apps means having the ability to edit the data locally while you're offline. And then when you regain your connection, the changes that you made should be synchronized up to the server so that your local copy of the data is a valid representation of the remote server's counterpart. But in order to really perform data synchronization, you'll want to make sure that you have control of the client and the server. This is not required, but it's going to make this much easier. If you are trying to synchronize your data with a third party server, then it's the server that's going to set the rules of how the synchronization needs to be done. So let's take a look at the workflow of offline editing. First, we'll make the initial request to the server for the data. And this is going to be no different than what we did in the caching example. We'll then retrieve the data back from the server. The key thing here is that we also need to make sure that within that data, we have enough information that will allow us to upload the, upload the data back to the remote system. So each record should have a unique identifier. The responses coming back should also have unique identifiers so that we can check for conflicts. When you're editing the data, it's recommended that you apply the edits against the local cache service. So for inserts, you would insert into your local database and create a correlation identifier value. For updates, you would record the fact that the record has updated. And for deletions, you'll just mark the record as deleted. And then when you have a valid network connection, you'll use your local data repository class and go get the list of local changes to the application. You'll then serialize that collection of records and transmit them and send them back to the server. And it's at this point where we'd use our network classes like HTTP client to push those changes through to the server. Next, you would retrieve the information from the server with the re result of the synchronization. And that's going to indicate if it was successful, unsuccessful, or potentially even partially successful. You'll also receive details about primary keys for inserted records, and you can retrieve a list of records that might have been removed from the server during that process as well. For conflicting information, you might, depending on the business rules of your system, display information to the user, and you may send the confirmed response to the conflict to the server for the same process. Again, keep in mind that performing these operations will mean that the complexity of the applications will increase significantly. When you're creating a system that will synchronize data, ideally you want to sync your model objects and not sync at the data table level it will be the server's responsibility to determine what should be updated. From the client, you want to send as much information to the server to allow the synchronization to occur. And as these model classes could potentially be referenced between the server and the client, you'd want to have them stored in their own library, either portable class library or .NET standard. So to set up as much reuse as possible, you would create a portable class library or a .NET standard library that contains your model classes. You would then make sure that your mobile projects reference that library, as well as the web server also referencing that same library. So in this way, the data can be easily serialized and sent to the mobile clients and you're not replicating your code. Again, mechanisms like ASP.NET, MVC's web API would be a good mechanism for this. But there are several challenges that you would find in synchronizing the details from the server. So let's have a look at these challenges and work through them together. 
Most of the challenges deal with updating the data while you're offline. Our first challenge will look at creating new records while you're offline. When we're offline, we'll have to insert records into the local database. For most enterprise systems and distributed systems, it's the database connected to the server that is responsible for creating the primary keys for the records. While you're offline, you won't have access to that function, and you'll need a mechanism to update your local system so that when the record is synchronized with the server, it will be able to update the server's record. For this, we're going to use a property called a correlation ID. This value is a unique identifier, like a GUID, on the record, separate from the primary key. Once the record has been created on the server, you can return the record's primary key as well as its correlation ID so that the local record knows it's updated. If the primary key on your server is already a GUID, you might be able to ignore the correlation ID, but often you're linking to an existing database that just uses an integer for the primary key. Another challenge is what happens when you update a record on the server. Quite likely, you'll have multiple devices that will download a particular record from the server. But what happens when two devices go to update the same record? Which record will be updated? Well, it often depends on the business rules of your application, and it's going to be up to you to architect that. It might be that the last update wins, or you might want to send back the fact that the second person is trying to update the record, and they might need to update their information first. The way to manage this is to ensure that each record has a version number associated with it. In this way, when the devices perform an update, then they want to make sure that they're updating the same version that they've been editing. When a record is updated on the server, then you'll make sure that you update the version to the next version number. That way, when a second user attempts to update that record, it will know that it's updating an older version of the record, and that information could be reported back to the user or back to the device that's performing that synchronization. In a similar way, another challenge that you'll have is deleting records while you're offline. You might need to record the fact locally that the record's been deleted, but you don't want to actually delete that record from your local database. That means that you'll likely be, be performing a soft delete against the local database. It will also mean that all of your queries against your local database should be updated to reflect the data that has been deleted and, and filter that out. We can just use a locally is deleted property on your object to store. When you eventually synchronize to the server, you'll need to update locally that the record's been deleted. As other users will also delete records that you might have stored locally, while synchronizing, you'll also need to bring back a list of records that you might have stored locally that have been deleted from the server by other users. Also, if you try to perform an update on a record that's been deleted on the server, you'll need to report back that the record has been deleted and record that as a conflict. And again, depending on the business rules of your app, you might send that back to the client to confirm what to do, or you might just insert a new record. When you're handling update and delete conflicts, if you need to confirm information to the users, you'll probably have to display information about the records that are in conflict. And that means you'll often have to display information about the records and when they were updated. While this example shows the date time of when the records were created, updated, and deleted, you might also want to store the usernames associated with those inserts, updates, and deletes to show the conflict details. Also, when you're storing the time, you might want to store the time of when it occurred as a UTC time, universal time, and then convert it to the local time zone when you're presenting it on the device. Keep in mind that the date times here are used for presentation only. You wouldn't use this to check versions. In a multi-user environment, there are going to be times when you'll be working with data that other users work with too. Any user might be able to edit, insert, or delete a record, and then synchronize with the server. Well, you have a challenge where, according to your business rules, you might have to be notified when other users manipulate that data. As part of the synchronization process, the backend service might need to keep a record of which records that you've downloaded so that if, if other users have edited or deleted them, you can receive a notification and then merge them into your local copy if that's needed. Again, keep in mind that this challenge might not be necessary. It could be that each device has its own copy of the data, and in that case, you might be able to avoid this. But if multiple users or devices have access to the same information, then you'll need to coordinate that effort. So you'll need data storage of which records and which versions a user has access to, as well as a mechanism to download any deletes or updates 
that others have made that might affect the data that you already have. All right, so now you've seen some of the challenges that come with synchroniz synchronization. And it makes sense that the work done to combat those changes can be put into a base class. So here we're using the information from those previous challenges. We're adding the correlation ID for inserts, adding the version number to record updates and deletes, adding the is deleted for offline deletes, and adding the dates and times for the records being updated. This means that our customer class that's going to be used for the synchronization can be subclass from the sync object, and then it can contain just the model information that's required for the customer. To make a solid architecture, you want to hide the complexity so that you can work on the main business logic of your application and not repeat yourself. This is one example of how you can achieve that level of abstraction with your synchronization. For now, that's what we're going to look at for the model classes. We're going to be passing those model classes to and from the servers in our example code. Moving now to the server side, let's see how we can perform the synchronization. Just like how the model can be abstracted, often with the server sync process, we can abstract that as well. Each model class that will be synchronized will need to have the ability to insert, update, and delete records. You can see in the base server sync class that it has that ability to insert, update, and delete as records. It also has a get item method to return the current version of a record on the server. We'll need that capability to see when the record versions are different between the one being synchronized from the client and the version on the server. The server sync capability should also have some housekeeping options for setup before an operation and after an operation. That's why we have the setup method, which could be used to potentially start a transaction on the server's database. And then we would have a commit and a rollback to determine what to do when the operation has completed successfully or failed. We also have an audit method here because you might need to track which operations have been occurring and push that information back as well. And then the last method that you can see in this list is the process method. This is the key method that performs the synchronization operations on the system. The force changes flag is used to send changes after the user interface has responded to what should be done after a conflict. We would then create a subclass of the base server sync using the model class so that we can perform the synchronization against the server. As a result of having these classes, you can then expose them through services like Web API in order to retrieve the details. So here we have a simple customers controller. This would be an API controller that's returning a list of customers, and it also contains the ability to push the changes from local devices. In the case of the post method, it's receiving a collection of customers to process and then passing it on to our customer data sync class that we just looked at in order to process it. Now this is just one example using Web API, but your backend server really could be anything. It could be Ruby on Rails, it could be Node.js, it could be a third party system. Again, as long as your client and server agree on the format. So that sync method will be called from the client side and you'll need to incorporate into your mobile client the ability to pass the data to synchronize to the server. In our REST client class, we would serialize the object to sync and then post them to the appropriate URL. We'll then get the results back from the server. And this is using the same techniques that you would have learned from the web services class. The important thing here is we're going to receive the sync result of type customer so that you can examine and update the results of the sync. Now, when you're performing a synchronization on iOS, it would make sense to flag the operation as a long running task. That way you'll get up to three minutes to actually perform the synchronization successfully. We cover long running tasks in our backgrounding in iOS course, which is iOS 210, and you can learn those techniques there. And then likewise for Android, you'll want to make sure that your synchronizations are occurring as a background service. And ideally, you'd want this as a hybrid service so that you can connect and receive updates on the status of the synchronization. And here you can see the full process working in the background on an Android app. Now it's time to go work on the second exercise. We've included a demonstration application that will demonstrate the entire synchronization process. Open that solution up, explore the code for a little while, pause this video, and then come back when you're done. So now you've seen some of the process of synchronization to a remote system, including some of the challenges of dealing with offline data and the kinds of conflicts that can come from a system such as this. And we've seen how a system could be built to accommodate those synchronization requirements. 
In this next section, we're going to look at some of the other available options for synchronizing rather than coding it all ourselves. So we've gone through the process of coordinating a synchronized application, but this has been for a single model object. Developing your system along those lines would require a significant amount of work. There are reasons why you might, wa might not want to do that. And we'll look at some of those reasons, and then we'll talk about some of the third party options that are available. The main reason why you would evaluate other options instead of coding it all yourself is the classic build versus buy decision. With your custom build operation, you'll have the potential of risk if the implementation is incorrect. And there are lots of different edge cases that you'll need to know about and catch those. Coding it all yourself will need significantly more levels of testing. Fortunately, there are tools in the marketplace that you could potentially leverage that are solely designed to perform synchronization because it's such a significant challenge in the enterprise. Enterprises might also have the need to get to market quickly in order to take advantage of the first mover advantage or changes in the environment. So for those reasons, it makes sense to evaluate the alternatives that exist. So here you can see three popular uh, potential third party systems that you could integrate into your mobile apps. So there's Azure mobile apps, which Xamarin University has a few different classes talking about Azure mobile apps. You could choose Couchbase, Zoomero, there's also Realm, there's a few others. I highly suggest go evaluate these tools and see if they make sense in your application. Leave it to the experts for the synchronization. So there we see some of the third party options. Again, I recommend take a look at some of those. Thank you for watching this video on data caching and synchronization with Xamarin University. Thank <music> you.